Hi everyone, I'm going to do a review video for your lab exam three next week. So I'm just gonna go over the labs that it's going to cover. And I'm just gonna do a very small summary of each lab, but I do want you to study each lab in detail. I want you to know the slides. And again, your lab exam three is 30 questions, mostly multiple choice on this material. So I'm gonna start by covering the first lab that's on it. So let me, so the first lab that you have to know is the P blue lab. So let me do a share screen with that. Okay, so here is the P blue lab. So for this lab, the idea of this lab with P blue is P blue is a plasmid and plasmids are extra pieces of DNA. And in this lab, what you were supposed to do is you were supposed to, if you had been in class, students were supposed to take this plasmid and put it into E. coli cells, which is called transformation. And then once the plasmid is in E. coli, that plasmid gives E. coli abilities that it didn't have before. So it gives it resistance to ampicillin, which is an antibiotic. And it also gives it the lac Z gene, which is for the enzyme beta galactosidase. So let's go over it. So understand what gene cloning is, what a recombinant organism is. And let me go through to so watch all of these slabs in detail, but basically in this lab, you're transforming E. coli cells. You're taking regular E. coli bacterial cells. And remember, E. coli is generally, as bacteria itself, it is not resistant to ampicillin. So ampicillin is an antibiotic that kills E. coli. So in general, E. coli cannot grow if there's ampicillin. Now, when we transform E. coli, so our recombinant E. coli cells now have the ability to grow on agar plates that have ampicillin added. And the way that we add our P blue plasmid, P stands for plasmid, blue comes from, it can, it creates blue colonies on agar plates that have X-gal added. So the way you get the plasmid in the bacteria is by artificial transformation. You make your E. coli cells competent, meaning you get the cell membrane to be a little bit more permeable, and then you heat shock the cells, or you can electroporate them, which is electrocute them, and then you get the pea blue plasmid in. And so I want everyone to go over this, but when we look at the P blue plasmid, it has these four things. So it has an origin of replication. Plasmids should have an origin of replication. It has a gene to give bacteria the ability to be resistant to ampicillin. So when we look at the plasmid, it has a beta, beta galactosidase gene, and that is the lac Z gene. It's the same thing. It codes for an enzyme which allows bacteria to break down lactose. And when when this happens on a certain agar plate, you get a blue color. And then it has restriction sites, which we call multiple cloning sites. And this is where you can clone in specific genes. So watch that lab in detail, but that's a take home message of this lab. And then what you do after you get your P blue plasmid into E. coli by artificial transformation, which can happen by heat shocking the cells or electroporating them, you go and you take your cells, you have three control plates and these just have E. coli on them. You grow E. coli on the different agar plates. Now E. coli will grow on regular LB agar, we should see white colonies. It will not grow with on plates that have ampicillin because E. coli is not resistant to ampicillin and it will not grow on a plate that has ampicillin X-gal. X-gal is an analog of a sugar, um, but it won't grow because there's ampicillin. So that's regular E. coli. When we take our recombinant E. coli, which is our E. coli that has a P. blue plasmid, it will grow, grow on the LB agar white regular colonies. It will grow on the agar that also has ampicillin because now it has the gene that makes it resistant to ampicillin. This is the recombinant E. coli. And it will also grow on the plate that has ampicillin and x -gal. But on that plate, we will specifically see blue colonies. And the reason we see blue colonies is because when beta galactosidase cleaves x -gal, you get a blue color. So this is the only plate that should have blue colonies. 
And so the objective of this lab that I want everyone to know for your lab exam is I want you to know which genes are present on the engineered plasmid. So we talked about epsilon resistance gene, beta galactosidase gene. It also has an origin of replication, the P-blue plasmid, and then it also has restriction sites. How we get the plasmid, the P-blue plasmid in E. coli, is through artificial transformation. So we heat shock the E. coli cells and we get the plasmid in. There's calcium ions present also if you're doing the experiment in lab to neutralize the charges. And then you take your E. coli, regular E. coli, and recombinant E. coli. Recombinant E. coli is the E. coli that has the P-blue plasmid and you plate it on agar plates. And then when we look at the various plates, we should not see E. coli growing on plates that have ampicillin, but recombinant E. coli with the P-blue plasmid will. And watch the video to see which plates have blue colonies and which don't. A recombinant organism is an organism that has DNA from an outside source. So uh, here we create recombinant E. coli because we add P-blue into our E. coli. So that's the P-blue lab. Okay, so I might put a plate and ask you to discuss what the col color of the colonies mean, know what color colonies and if we should even see colonies on each plate and then know what the plasmid consists of. So watch that lab. The next lab I'm gonna go over is the viruses lab. So let's do that. Okay, so here is the viruses lab. So now in the next few labs, we are going to talk about basically um, what, uh, what you will have to fill out for your pathogens charts. So the viruses lab. So in this lab, you learn about what viruses are. So know that they're not cells, they're not alive. So we say they're acellular, they're just infectious agents. There's beneficial, there's detrimental virus. And then we focus on the Epstein-Barr virus or EBV virus, which is also known as a human herpes virus 4. So I want everyone to know what these microscope slides are. I might have these on your lab, on your lab exam three. So here are images of blood cells of a person who has the Epstein-Barr virus. So they have this infection, they have the disease infectious mononucleosis. The etiology is that EBV is caused by a virus, so infectious mononucleosis. And we, we look at a patient that has mono or infectious mononucleosis, we look for downy cells, which are abnormal white blood cells, specifically lymphocytes. And then the symptoms usually is someone is really tired and they have very swollen lymph nodes. We so have lymph nodes all over your body. Transmission is saliva, oral, oral. Treatment is just getting plenty of rest so that your immune system can fight it and prevention is to avoid people with it. So the viruses lab is just pretty simple. Here are all the slides showing abnormal lymphocytes. So lymphocytes should not look like this where you can see that the outside of this lymphocyte don't look like a traditional round lymphocyte. So we call these downy cells. We cannot see viruses, but we can see downy cells. And then for this lab, know that viruses are not cells. They're acellular infectious agents. Downy cells are abnormal lymphocytes. And know what those pictures look like and then fill your pathogens chart. So that's the viruses lab. The next lab I'm gonna go over is, so let me close viruses. The next lab I'm gonna go over is the bacteria lab. So in this, you're also going to use this lab to fill your pathogens chart. So in this lab, you learn about Neisseria gonorrhea and Bacillus anthracis. So both of these bacteria cause different diseases and I want you to know what they look like under the microscope. So if you have a patient and they have gonorrhea and you take a sample from them, this is an example of what you could see. If you have a patient who has anthrax, this is an example of what the bacteria look like. Mm. So with this lab, know about bacteria, the details here I speak of in that lab, what biofilms are, which you've already talked about. And then here I talk about bacterial nutritional pathways and I do focus that chemo organoheterotrophs are the organisms that are important medically because they're the ones that typically cause disease. They take energy from the host and they take carbon from you. So they take nutrients and energy.
Okay, so now the goal of this lab is to know all about the bacteria Neisseria gonorrhea, which causes the disease gonorrhea. The etiology of this disease is it's caused by gram-negative diplococcus bacteria. That's what Neisseria gonorrhea are. And you guys remember gram-negative bacteria are red. That's why these images are red and they're diplococcus, so you see two circles. So symptoms of gonorrhea are pus discharge, vaginal discharge, um, painful, a painful penis, testes, just any private parts that have gonorrhea and then transmission. It's typically, a, we don't say STDs anymore and now we're starting to say sexually transmitted infections, STIs, and babies born to infected mothers can have ophthalmia neonatorum. Treatment is antibiotics, it's, an, it's a bacterial infection. So go through these. If on an exam I give you these images and I ask you what's the transmission of this, know that this is Neisseria gonorrhea. So go out and fill your pathogens charts. Then another organism I want you to know about is the self anthrax, which causes inhalational anthrax, or typically people just say anthrax. It's a very bad lung infection, so people have trouble breathing, and they have a lot of chest pain. And if you take a sample from someone, these are the slides that you would see. The etiology is these are gram-positive rod bacteria. So go through that. If I give you these images, I want you to know what they are. So for this lab, I want you to know bacterial morphologies. So we talked about this early on in the semester, like there's caucus, there's rods, what these shapes mean, what they look like. What are biofilms? They're a medical concern because they're hard to treat. They're bacterial communities. A micro, what is the microbiome? So remember, microbiome are bacteria that are generally found in someone, all the bacteria found on them. So go through all of these. And the main thing I wanna say is I really want you all from this specific PowerPoint to know what these bacteria look like under the microscope. So you guys cannot look at microscope slides because it is an online class, but you might on an exam get a slide image and I ask you, what is this? So know those, fill out your pathogens chart. Okay, that is the bacteria lab. The next lab I'm going to go over is molds. We'll do molds and yeast. So here is the mold lab. So in this lab, you learn about molds and molds are not prokaryotes, they're eukaryotic organisms. I want everyone to know that molds and yeast, for right now we're talking about molds, are part of domain eukarya and they're part of the kingdom fungi. They're multicellular, they're non-motile, they cannot move and they're filamentous. And so they're aerobic. And so for a mold, you need oxygen for mold to grow. If you take away oxygen, mold doesn't grow. So I want everyone to go through the background and the life cycle, which I explained in that lab. Okay, and then we talk about how mold can be beneficial. You, we get our, a lot of our antibiotics from mold and then it can be detrimental. It can cause mycoses, which are opportunistic fungal infections that affect immunocompromised individuals. Yay. And then from this, just to summarize, if you were in lab or if you are a scientist that study molds, we use agar called sabarad agar, which is selective for fungi because it has low pH and high sugar. So you stop bacteria from growing because you specifically want to grow a mold. And we use a stain called lactophenol blue. So a lot of scientists who work with mold, if you look at microscope images, you see blue because lactophenol blue stain is really good for staining mold. Okay, and then go through these images. So I get, if I give you these images on a lab practical, I want you to know that they're a mold. I want you to know that the, if I ask you what part of the life cycle this is, this is mycelium. So we see all the multiple hyphae together. And then I want you to know all about aspergillus. So in the video, I explain it. Know that this is what it looks like under the slide, and it can cause the disease aspergillosis, which mainly occurs in people who already have infections or immunocompromised individuals, which can be pregnant women, older people, young children. And so go through these images, know what they look like. 
And then we talk about cocoides in the mold lab video. So I want you to know about this infection as well, what it looks like under the microscope. So here are images of cocoides. Penicillium, here it is. Rhizopus, this is what rhizopus mold looks like, which typically causes bread mold. And so domain and kingdom, so everyone should know that their domain, eukarya, kingdom, fungi, are molds motile? I said they're not motile, they're aerobic organisms. Benefits and detriments of them, and then fill the pathogens chart of the molds for this. So go through all of these. And I know you don't wanna hear this. Basically, you need to know everything about the labs. Okay, then the next lab I want everyone to study is the yeast lab. So in yeast, most people are, when we think yeast, uh, I think people are divided in that they think baking yeast, and then they think yeast infections, which is good to think of these things because you realize that they're all part of the same domain. So yeast, that's really good that we use in baking every day, and yeast that causes pretty bad infections, very common prevalent infections. So yeasts are eukaryotic organisms. They're also part of the kingdom fungi, they're unicellular unlike molds. So molds are multicellular, yeasts are unicellular. They're also non-motile and they're chemoorganoheterotrophs. They're facultative anaerobes. Remember molds are aerobic organisms. Yeasts are facultative anaerobes, meaning they can basically grow everywhere. So if I ask you questions on lab exam, true and false or differences between mold and yeast, know that. And then yeast reproduction. So for yeast, when we think of sexual and asexual reproduction, asexual reproduction is budding and sexual reproduction, we see ascospores under the microscope. Okay, so here are the benefits and the detriments. And then I want you to fill your pathogens chart for candida albicans to go through them. So this yeast, which is again, a eukaryotic organism, it causes, the, it causes superficial mycoses. So it causes typical yeast infection, which when we think of is vulval vaginal candidiasis. And this organism is overgrowth of yeast in the vagina, which is very common. And it is an infection that we see a lot with immunocompromised patients. A lot of times we see females who are taking antibiotics and then from all the antibiotics, we see a yeast infection. And so they're generally non-transmissible and the treatment is antifungal medications or sometimes people do nothing for it and the yeast infection goes away on its own. And then I also tell students that if you were in class, we look at Saccharomyces cerevisiae under the microscope. And so you can see ascospore slides. Remember there's ascospores and there's budding. Ascospores indicate sexual reproduction. Budding indicates when you just have a cell budding from another cell, it's asexual reproduction. And then here are images. So if I give you images on your lab exam, I want everyone to know that they are yeast and what specific yeast they are. Okay, so go through these questions and then fill your pathogens chart on them. Okay, then the other lab I wanna go over is the eukaryotic parasites. So that one really take your time watching that video. So let's do eukaryotic parasites. Okay, this is a final lab that you need to watch to fill your pathogens chart. And I hope you use your pathogens chart to study. So we talk about pathogens. Pathogens are anything that cause disease that are eukaryotic carrier even further. And we talk about three different groups. So in the lab video for this lab, you learn about protozoa, helminth, which is a fancy word for worms, and then arthropods, so insects, when you think of them. So I want you to take time going through this lab because we don't spend a lot of time in class focusing on eukaryotic parasites. A lot of times we're talking about bacterial infection and viruses, but there's a whole big area of infections when we think of healthcare with eukaryotic parasites. And they're typically very hard to treat in general because they are eukaryotic, like us, we're eukaryotic organisms. So when you have a eukaryote infect a eukaryote, it's hard to think of treatments that will harm the pathogen without harming the, the host, which is yourself. So for this lab, 
you learn about unicellular organisms, which are protozoa, and then multicellular organism, helms, worms, and arthropods. So take time going over this. I want everyone to know the definition of a parasite if there is a fill in the blank question. If I tell you an organism that lives in or on a host and takes nutrients from the host is a blank, that's a good fill in the blank question. And then we go through the three categories of parasites. So with the parasitic protozoa, you learn about Giardia, Trypanosoma, Plasmodium. So with Plasmodium falciparum, I'm gonna go to, and then we learn about helminth and arthropods. I want, to, I want you to go through all of these when you fill your pathogens charts, but let me, we're gonna focus on the protozoa. So go through Giardia, the infection, the etiology is protozoa, and the images. So if I give you these images, I want you to know what they are. So this here is a fecal sample because this is how you get this infection. And we see this Giardia lamblia protozoa or protist in the water. Okay, Trypanosoma brucei is an organism that causes African sleeping sickness. And this is a pretty prominent infection or disease that we see throughout the world, specifically in West and Central Africa. And when we take samples from individuals, when we take a blood sample, if they are infected, you see the trypanosoma protozoa in their blood. Okay, and then we talk about Plasmodium falciparum. There, so this organism, this protist, causes malaria. A lot of people think malaria is caused by bacteria or viruses. It's caused by neither. Malaria as a disease is caused by protists. So we really need to understand the protist in order to treat it. So fill in your pathogens chart. These are very good images to use on a lab exam. So with a malaria patient, if you take a blood sample from them, you'll see purple dots within red blood cells. And this could be an indication that a person has a plasmodium infection, they have malaria. And then we talk about the worms. And for the three worms that you learn about, you learn about Ascaris, Taina, and Schistosoma. So go through the worm categories. And remember, these are multicellular organisms. And I want everyone to know that a nematode is a roundworm. So common, um, the common word among regular people not in healthcare, they say roundworm. People in healthcare say nematode. Tapeworm is cestode and fluke is trematode. So go through the nematode, the roundworm, Ascaris lumbricoides, which is all the same thing. This organism here is a tapeworm or cestode, Taina solium. And then fill in your pathogens chart and watch my video where I explain this about Schistosoma mansoni and about all why in this organism it's very important to avoid contaminated water and to basically, with all of these swarms, you learn that it's very important to have access to clean water and. We see, uh, we see a high amount of these infections in areas where people don't have access to clean water. And then this one has an intermediate snail uh, host. So if I ask you which out of the pathogens that you learned about has an intermediate uh, organism that's a snail, I want you to know that it's just a Soma mansoni. And then when we get into the arthropods, which are also eukaryotic pathogens. So arthropods are basically insects and ticks and mites. And so here, I want you to know the difference between mechanical vector and biological vector and what this means. And then fill in your pathogens chart for the Anopheles mosquito, the Zoides tick, and then the Sarcoptes arthropod. So this one causes scapes, which is a mite. And so go through that video. And then I want you to go through what a parasite is, the three categories of eukaryotic parasites that you were supposed to learn. So protozoa, helminth, arthropods, and know which organisms are unicellular, which are not. Know the three helminth you studied. So go through all of these, fill your pathogens chart. And for this, I really like the other um, labs that I spoke about. I really want you to know what they look like under the microscope. These are very important for a microbiologist. So when someone comes with an infection, as a microbiologist, one of the first easiest things to do is to get a fecal sample or a blood, a blood sample or a saliva sample and look under the microscope and see 
what you, what it looks like because that gives you an indication what type of infection someone has. Okay, so I went through the P blue lab, the viruses lab, the eukaryotic parasites lab, the bacteria lab, mold lab, and yeast lab. So these six labs you need to know if you're in the 119 Thursday class. The Monday class is a five unit class, so they have two more labs to, that they have to know, which I'm gonna go over now. But my 119 students, you're done. I'm gonna go over PCR and bacteriophage for my Monday 146 students. Okay, so to continue on, so for my Monday students, you also learned about PCR as an experiment. So with this lab, I want you to know what the goal of PCR is, what PCR is. So if I ask you a question, what is PCR? I want everyone to know that it's a process that amplifies small amounts of DNA, specific DNA pieces. So I want you to also know the components of what we put in our PCR tube. So the components are you have to have a DNA, you have to have primers that target the specific gene you're trying to amplify. Remember gene and DNA are the same thing. Nucleotides, ATCG, because we're trying to amplify DNA or make more DNA and that's what DNA is made up of. And then we also have TAC polymerase, which is the enzyme that's similar to DNA polymerase that makes new strands of DNA. Okay, and then you put your PCR tube in a thermocycler, you go through these steps, and then once you've, you did your PCR, it's been out, it's out of the thermocycler, you put it on a gel, which we call gel electrophoresis. So here's the gel electrophoresis. And this machine, its goal is to separate DNA by size. So when you load that, you put a gel here, and when you load the gel, you plug it in and there's electricity and it separates DNA by size. And then you're able to visualize to see if you actually amplified the DNA fragment you're interested in. This is exactly, by the way, what they're doing with COVID testing. So if you see that they're doing PCR with COVID testing, they get a sample from someone. So now they're doing the nose swabs and they do PCR to try to amplify um, to try to amplify a gene that's specific for the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus and then they run it on a gel to separate the DNA fragments by size and if they see that fragment they know that the person has an infection if they don't. So next time you look at COVID-19 test results when you see PCR that's what they're doing. Okay so in this lab there were two parts to this lab. Once you know what PCR is there's a uh, part of lab where you learn about why we use PCR to identify archaea samples and then when we use PCR to identify MRSA bacteria samples. So just know there are two different components. Both are using PCR. Okay, so with MRSA, go through what that is. You, in this lab, what you were supposed to do is you were supposed to amplify three different genes that are important that we see with MRSA infection. So a person that has MRSA, we should see the Staphylococcus 16S ribosomal DNA band. We should see the FEMA DNA or gene band. And this gene is important in MRSA because it's basically it's what helps the bacteria have so much resistance to antibiotics and then the MECA gene. So when we, okay, so we go through all of this. I wanna show the picture of, okay, so here is the archaea group, not the MRSA group. So with the archaea part of this lab, the idea was you were supposed to learn that we can use PCR to identify that a sample is an archaea sample. And a sample that is archaea should have a bacterial 16S rRNA gene. Um, I, I'm sorry, let me back away. Uh, so a sample that is archaea will not B bacteria, so we do not see a bacterial gene. We see a gene band for archaea and we see a gene band for prokaryotic 16S rRNA. So again, when we look at an archaea sample, you will see the band for the archaea 16S rRNA and for the prokaryotic universal 16S rRNA. You will not see the bacteria band because they're completely different things. For the MRSA side of the PCR, if a patient has MRSA, you should be able to amplify all three genes. We should see the FEMA gene, the Staphylococcus 16S rRNA gene, and the MECA gene. So go through that lab. 
And mainly to summarize what I want you, I know this lab is a little bit hard to understand since you're not doing it in class. I want you to know the components of PCR, which we talked about. I want you to know the purpose of PCR. And then I just want you to have an idea of what primers were used in the Archaea uh, part of this lab and then in the MRSA part of this lab, like Fem A, Mac A, these types of primers. Okay, and then finally, the last lab that you have to go over is a bacteriophage titer lab. So for the bacteriophage titer lab, you learn about bacteriophage. Bacteriophage are viruses that infect bacteria. And then we talk about the two different cycles we see. So with bacteriophage or phage, it's the same thing. We see the lytic cycle. These viruses cause bacteria to lyse, and we see temperate phages that have both the lytic and the lysogenic cycle. They're temporary in both phases. So lysogenic cycle means that a bacteriophage will just put its genetic material in the bacteria's genetic material, but won't necessarily cause it to lyse. So lytic cycle, lysogenic cycle, and then temperate phages have both. So lytic phages just have the lytic cycle, Temperate phages have lytic and lysogenic cycle. And so in this lab, you do the double agar technique and you're basically mixing bacteriophage with E. coli, with agar, putting them all in an agar plate and then you incubate the plates and you come back. And then when you see these holes, these indicate plaques. Plaques mean that the virus or the bacteriophage has lysed the bacteria. That's why we see a hole. So in lab, students do a dilution of viruses. The plate that has the most viruses, we see the most opening or plaques. The plate with the least viruses has very little plaque on it. So plaques are clearings and they indicate phage. Okay, and then here is PFU, calculating PFU per milliliter. So for this lab, I want you to know what the, we just talked about the double agar technique. I want you to know what a plaque is. If I give you one of these images and I ask you what experiment this is, I want you to know that this is a bacteriophage experiment and why, what are we doing serial dilution of? Remember, we're diluting the viruses. Okay, so that's it. So to summarize my 119 class, you have to know the pea blue lab, viruses lab, eukaryotic parasites, bacteria, molds, and yeasts lab. My 146, in addition to those, you also have to know the bacteriophage lab and the PCR lab. And then your exam is next week. It's 30 questions, multiple choice. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to email me.